do not want Bama. Like, no way. But if we are being real, and my high bank back to you, Hawks, right now, I am so hyped. I think I told my wife like 25 times this weekend, I just cannot believe the Hawks are 2-0. You know? When I was in college, we won three games. So three games, three in like 43. And so, it's amazing. We got a football player here tonight. So, uh, man, I, I am excited to be here. And I've been thinking about this, but I wanted to ask you guys a question, or this question. Have you ever been asked a question that you weren't ready for? Or you weren't expecting, like, the question hits and it just, like, smokes you in the face like a right hook. Like, you just don't know how to respond. Is that anybody? Anybody feel that? I, uh, if you know me or you're good enough friends with me, you know I'm, that I do things that smarter people probably wouldn't do. I just I feel like I have a ton of these stories. Um, but there's one story that specifically hurts. And when I was thinking about it today, I was cringing. But in my junior year, a couple of my close buddies and I got asked to a sorority day party. We had one really good friend in the house. We knew her well. But she had a, a, a group of friends that she was kind of setting us up. And we, so we didn't know. We were just kind of going to meet them when we showed up to the house. And so it came the day, day party day. We, we roll over. Um, and, and in 15 seconds of getting there, we're meeting all these girls. And you know that when you put your hand out to meet someone, shake someone's hand, magically, all your other senses just like stop working, right? Like someone's been there, you shake someone's hand, you have no idea what their name is. And uh, definitely has happened to me. And uh, so in 15 seconds, I'm shaking all these girls' hands, one in particular, and within a couple minutes, we're taking pictures, we're mingling, mingling we're out on a bus, we're going to the, to the venue. Very shortly, I, we're sitting down for dinner, and I happen to be sitting down next to this one lady, and we actually had an amazing conversation. I think we talked for almost like an hour and a half, maybe. Like By the time this conversation got over, I could have told you her hometown. I could have told you her, 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 her major. I could have told you what her friend group was like, what she was involved in on campus, what her family, how many siblings she had. But there was one thing I just could not remember. And I knew it. And we got up from the, from the table. And soon we're out on a, the dance floor. And we're having fun. We're having fun. And all of a sudden she sees her, her roommates. And she's like, oh, i got, I got to introduce you to my roommates. And I'm like, great. I think me and my buddy came up, and we, we meet all of them. She goes, hey, this is Megan. This is Molly. Hey, this is Tasha. And she, in, in front of this whole circle, she looks at me and goes, and so what's my name? And, and, I, and I look, and I, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for that question. And I responded with 15 seconds of silence, and then a, I am so sorry. And... <laughs> And, and then I quickly just went to the bathroom. I was like, I am so sorry. I told my buddy. Um, but probably all of us have been in a, a situation like that. We weren't ready for a question. Or we weren't ready to answer it. Maybe a teacher calls on you in class and you're snoozing. And, and now the whole class is laughing and you feel about like two inches tall. Anyone been there? Definitely was. Or a guy with a lot of gear. Maybe, maybe some gear like right here. Blue outfit walks in on the weekend and he, and he asks you, looks you in the face and he goes, how did you get in here? Or how old are you? Or, or let me see your ID and you just have no idea. You don't know what to say. Or you're a lady and some, so you get this phone call from this random number or not random number and it's that question. Will you go out on a date with me? Silence. We've all been there. Yeah, but been there with questions that you have to answer. Like you can't avoid them. These questions are to you, and you have to respond. Anyone feel that pressure? Like our questions right to you. In our life, we're going to be asked a ton of questions. Some questions way more important than others. Some questions are life changing. I got to ask one of these life changing questions about um, a year and a half ago, or almost two. Years ago, this question was only four words, and I got, got to ask it to my best friend, and uh, it was right at the bottom of a ski slope where I got to get down on one knee and ask the question, will you marry me? This was it. This was later that day. And, uh, luckily, 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 she had prepared. She, she knew what the answer was. She was ready. Four and four months later, we or a couple months later, we got married. But one question, 
change my life. One question. There's a moment in the Bible that I think records an even greater question than this. Like, it's a, it's a more life-changing question. It's a much more polarizing question than this. And I want to make the case tonight that this is actually the most important question that any of us in this room are ever going to answer our whole life. That question is, who is Jesus really? Who is Jesus really? If you've been coming to Late Night, you know we've been in this series called Be Real, where we've been looking at real topics, asking real questions, and just trying to have honest conversations about them. And so tonight, the question we're looking at is, who is Jesus really? And we see this, this question woven throughout the Bible, um, throughout all the biographies of Jesus' life, but it most clearly comes out in this one specific moment, one interaction between Jesus and his closest friends. So before this moment happens, these friends had, had, have gotten to see so much of Jesus' life. They'd followed him for almost two years. They were constantly around him. They got to hear his teaching. They got to hear Jesus break people's paradigms, totally transform people's paradigms for who God was and what he was like. They got to see him heal people, just person after person. They got to see him do miracles that they just could not have an explanation for. They didn't know how to explain. So these three friends saw so much of Jesus, but it wasn't just these friends, everyone in this area, in the area at the time, knew about Jesus. And in what they were witnessing in Jesus' life was so different than anything they had ever seen before that no one was without an opinion about him. Everyone had an opinion. And although Jesus didn't really care about the, the opinion of the crowds around him, he knew that the noise was increasing. And it got to a point for him, he's just with his close followers, and he's about to enter a city, and he stops. And he stops, he turns around to those closest friends, and he asks this question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Or in other words, what are people's takes on me? Or who are people saying that I am? Son of Man was another term that Jesus referred to him as, and other people did. And the disciples look at each other and they're like, okay, and one steps forward and they respond. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. If, if y'all don't have any idea who these people are, that is totally okay. Um, they were just people that came before Jesus. And they, they, they spoke about God to people at the time. And so what, the, what those followers were saying, his close friends were saying, hey, Jesus... There's a whole array of, of opinions, of ideas, of what people think about you, what people think who you are. Maybe you're just like one of these guys. And I think if we ask this question today, who do we say Jesus, who do people say Jesus is? I think we would get all sorts of answers. We, we'd get some. I, I think some would say, hey, Jesus is a really good guy. I was on the other side of the planet this summer, and people were saying that. They didn't know anything about Jesus, but he's a good, I think he's a good guy. Jesus is a list of rules. Hey, I've heard this one. Jesus, I honestly don't think he's any different than Santa Claus. Jesus was, was a party pooper. Jesus was a really good moral teacher. Jesus is a religious guy that we should respect and learn from his character. I think, I could be totally wrong on this, but I think we all put Jesus, we all sometimes tend to put Jesus into a box. And that, that as long, this is what Jesus is to me. As long as we can keep him in that box, it's comfortable. It's safe. I, I, I can just leave him there. My boxes growing up, Jesus was um, the person I heard about on Sunday. Um, I knew he made a great sacrifice for us. But and my, honestly, Jesus was a party pooper. That was my box. Great person, great sacrifice, list of rules, party pooper. But what Jesus does next in the story shows that he, he doesn't want to stay in those boxes. He actually wants something so much more for us. And he, and he asks one of those questions that, that people just aren't prepared for. Just, it, it's, it's personal. And people often aren't ready. And he asks it straight to his people. He goes, okay, I know you say, I know you say people, all those ideas, but what do you say? What about you? Who do you say that I am? This is the question. This is what we're looking at. Who do you say I am? Or who is Jesus really? 
And I'm not going to exhaustively answer this question. There's no way I could. But I hope that tonight this serves as like an intro. That at the end of, the, at the end of tonight, you're actually more eager or you're more willing or, and you want to investigate this question. Who is Jesus to you? Or if it was from Him, who do you say He is? So what we're going to see as we dive into this question, we're going to see who is Jesus in His essence, like in His being. What, who is He? We're going to see who is Jesus in His character. Like what's He actually like? And then we're going to see, what does he promise to anyone that would come to him? And so this is your first late night, um, and we're just checking this out. We like to take these kind of topics and just ask, hey, what does the Bible have to say? I did not grow up with a ton of experience with the Bible, and I know a ton of people in here are coming from different backgrounds. We may have some people that are sitting here, and like, yeah, bro, I, I know the answer to that question. I, I got this. And they're like, hitting the guy next to him, like, I already know it. Or you have people in the room that... Like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know the answer to that question or anyone in between. I grew up going to church, but I really had never read the Bible growing up. And so the first thing we're going to see is who is Jesus in his essence and his being is that Jesus is both God and man. Jesus is both God and man. And if we're being real, this is the most controversial claim about Jesus. This is, this is maybe, I've actually heard it said that this is the most controversial claim in all of human history, that Jesus is God. Why is that so polarizing? Like, why is Jesus being God so polarizing? People love to talk about God. You see it at a Grammy, reward, like awards, acceptance speech, like, man, I, I thank God, or, or like an um, end of the game, um, post game interview. Like, people love bringing up God, but when someone says the name Jesus, and thanks to him, it's so different. The world reacts so differently. Why? Why? I think God, we can, God can feel distant. Joe talked about it last week that God is noble. He's, he is responsive. He wants to be known. He wants to be a friend. But I think when we talk about God in general, it's easy to put him at a distance. Jesus is personal. He, he lived a, a real Life and he makes us respond to it. And like his life, his death, and resurrection, and the claims he made about himself make us decide. Almost like a crossroads. Like when you're driving, you gotta go left or right. Like facing this this fork in the road, I gotta choose left or right. Which one, which one do I want to go? And I think Jesus does this. Who do you say I am? He's a crossroads for us, all of us. But if Jesus actually is God, what he did, what he said in, in his life and what he promised really matters. Like it actually matters if it's true. I heard this quote. Uh, this is from a guy named C.S. Lewis. It's Christianity, if false, is of no importance. Like it does not matter at all. If it's false, it's a waste of time. If it's true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing is it can't be is moderately important. It makes us choose who does Jesus say he is actually. And so, if we're actually looking at what the Bible says about Jesus being God, we would, we would, if we actually were to look at that question, we would see that this is the overarching claim of the Bible. So let's dive in. And so, let's start with his name. I did not know this coming into college, but Jesus Christ is not actually a first and last name. Jesus is, is a name, it's, it's the old, old Hebrew name Joshua. In, in Greek, it's, it's, it just means that God saves, or the Lord saves. And Christ is not a last name, it's actually a title. Um, it's actually, it, it means, um, Christ is that, it's the anointed one, or the chosen one. It refers back to the person that God had been promising the Hebrews for centuries. That this person that he was going to send into the world to save his people. And so Jesus Christ is Jesus, the one sent from God. But if that's different than Jesus actually being God, sent from God. But if he's actually God, what does it say? And so the Bible, this comes from all different areas that people say this, make this claim and come to this conclusion about Jesus being God. And we're going to try to cover as much as we can, but I can't cover all the angles. And we're going to cover them like one inch deep just because of time. But the first one is, what did his followers Think about it. What conclusion did they make? If you were to go back to that moment with that with that question, he says, "What do, what 
but what about you, he asked, what do you say that I am? We're going to see it right here in the disciples' response. And it says, Simon Peter stepped up, kind of the, the spokesperson for the group, and he says, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And what's crazy is Jesus actually affirms him. He goes, Simon, you're, you're right. Like, that's actually the truth. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, blessed are you. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. He says, hey, your wisdom didn't just come to that conclusion. My Father in heaven actually gave it to you. Another example of his close followers was a guy named Nathaniel. Nathaniel was actually a super skeptic of Jesus. When he first heard about Jesus, he goes, no way. No way could this guy actually be the Christ, the, the person that my people were waiting for for centuries. I don't believe it. No, not him. But after engaging Jesus, after interacting with him and, 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 and seeing Jesus with his own eyes, this is his conclusion. Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. These are just two examples of his followers' conclusions. And you guys, an uh, objection probably from the crowd would be, well, of course his followers would say that about him. Like, they're his followers. They're his closest friends. But what was crazy was this wasn't just the conclusion of everyone that was close to him. This was the conclusion of, of even some of his enemies, people from all different perspectives that were witnessing his life and saw his life and his death and even his resurrection after he came back. And even one example of this, of people that witnessed his life and his death and his resurrection was actually from an enemy. This was from a guy that um, was called the centurion. He was the leader of the, of, like a, of the Roman army, a leader of about 100 soldiers. And this specific man actually was the guy, the guy, that oversaw all of Jesus' crucifixion and his death. He got to give the orders that, 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 put, that had Jesus beat. He got to give the orders to have Jesus with a nail driven into his hands. And then he, he, was, he was watching and observing all of it going down as Jesus was put on a cross. But at the end of it, after you saw what happened, this was his conclusion. I don't, I don't think he even believed it himself. He was like, man, I, I can't believe it, but I think this is true. He goes, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he had died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. So we got his closest as far as we got people from all sorts of perspectives. But what's even crazier than these was this was the claim that Jesus made about himself. This was the overarching claim. We're going to look at this later in the semester. We're actually going to have, a couple, uh, I think, a talk or two just dedicated on, on something like this. Like, man, is this actually true? Can I actually believe this? But, but Jesus made this claim about himself, and it wasn't a subtle claim. It was loud and clear. We're just going to look at two examples. What were they? And one was super short. Jesus says, I am the Father that Joe talked about last week. We're one. One is, is, is in like essence. Like we're cut from the same cloth. We are together. There's no separation. We, we are the same. I and the Father. Two chapters later, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. You see, Jesus made the claim that he himself was God. And this was the most polarizing claim there had ever been. And so why, why is it so polarizing is that, is that it's putting himself on equal pedestal with God. But if Jesus is that, if he actually is God, what's even more crazier is that he became man. So how did this happen? How is Jesus both fully God and fully man? We're in like a couple more verses, but John says it in a kind of roundabout way, but he says this. Follow me with this. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So we got, in the beginning, before time, before creation, was the Word, and that Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man. The Word, and then the Word that was with God became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
the last one. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. If I were to sum up what we just read, basically what it's saying is eternal God with no beginning, in order to be known in a greater depth and to reveal Himself to us, came to us in a way that is most personal, most understandable, most relatable for people just like us, for humans. Why? So that we could know Him. He came, became man, and God became fully man. We see this in Hebrews 1. It says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things of his power, by His powerful Word. The exact representation of His being. I think this is paradigm changing. I mean, I'm like, because growing up, I always thought, no way anyone can actually know what God is like. Like, if there was a God, He's distant, He's far off, and I think we just have to guess and hope what He's like. That we can't actually know Him. But here the Bible says no. It says He wants to be known by us. He wants us to know what He is like, and He wants us to know Him. And He desired that so much that He actually became one of us just so we could. I think about the example. This is not a great example, but I'm like, man, if Tom Brady, I, I watched Tom Brady my whole life. I didn't like him, but I respected Tom Brady because he's amazing. And I never got to see him, but I only watched him from a distance from behind the TV. And, and like, I could know a little bit about him, but I would have no idea what he's actually like. But what if Tom Brady, who I've only seen in a far distance, one day called me up said, hey, Carson, hey, this is Tom. Tom Brady, I'm like, oh, wow. He goes, hey, this is crazy, but uh, I'm actually moving in. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be your roommate for the next year, right right into your room. And I, I would be like, wow. And he's like, why? I would be like, why are you doing that? And he goes, I, I want you to know I want you to know me, and I want to know you. Awesome. I'll see you next week. Hangs up, and it's like, this is what it'd be like. God, who is far distant, became someone that we could know. And so, um, because so when we look at Jesus, what it's saying is that we can actually know exactly what God is like. This is so different than what I expected. And so, Jesus is both God and man. And what's also amazing that when we actually learn what Jesus really is like, it's different than what we expect. It's not just who he is, but what's, what's his character like? I think it's one of the most amazing things that when people actually ask this question, who is Jesus, what they find is so different than what they expect. And when the second thing is, what's he like? Well, he's a humble servant savior. Humble servant savior. Raise your hand if you've ever worked at a restaurant or ever worked in some kind of food, busser, waitress, or a houseboy. I mean, y'all, yeah, y'all, you guys would know that it's some humble work. Like, it is a humble thing to, to clean or, or, or even, like, ever clean up after someone. It's like, as a pledge, I remember having to clean a ton. I remember being on uh, my honeymoon and the, 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 the woman who would come and clean our room, it was, it was so humbling that she would come and clean up right after us. It was almost hard to even let her do it, but she was just so humble of a person. How would you guys respond? So go back to being a buster or a, 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 like a maid of some sort. How would you guys respond if the president, one of, one of these guys, showed up to your dorm room or to your table and said, hey, I, I want to clean up after you. I, I'm, here, I'm here to clean, clean your mess. We would be shocked. We were like, no way. Like, why? This guy, you are so up there. Like, why would you stoop down to such a level? Like, that's, this is not who you are. You are beyond. You are beyond this right here. But if we look at, ask this question, who is Jesus? This is exactly what he did. Way, actually, way further than a president cleaning my table. We see this in Philippians 2. It says, but in your relationships with one another... Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What is it? Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, 
He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Again, this is paradigm shifting. And if we, if we remember what Joe said last week, Joe said that, hey, God is king. And that if, God, if, if Jesus is God, means he's equally king, Think about the kings of our day like this is not the picture we would ever see. This is actually total opposite. What we're seeing is infinite humility. That the God of the universe stooped down to become a little baby. If you know the Christmas story, if you've ever heard it, he, be, he, he, became, he was born. He entered into a life of a person. But then as he grows up, he didn't lord it over people. He never used his power to lord it or to flaunt it over people. Instead... What it says is he set his power, he set who he is aside to become a servant. And how much of a servant did he become? Well, it says even to the point of death. This, this descent from the throne of heaven to a cross is far greater than the White House to my bathroom. And this is what Jesus did. We see this in Mark 10.45. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, what we see of Jesus is, I always, it was paradigm changing. It's, I always thought Jesus wanted to take from my life. He wanted me to give, and he wanted to take. He, he had things to take from me, but instead it says, no, he came to serve and to give life. And we see his humility, his humble servant humility, all in so many ways in the Bible. But one of my favorite ways we see his humility is seeing who Jesus liked to be associated with. Who was he actually around? Who were the people that he associated with? Because I think that if, if Jesus was God and he came to earth, I would think that Jesus wanted to be around the prim and the proper, the, the super religious, the really, really good people. But that's super far from the truth. And if we actually were answering this question honestly, who is Jesus Really, what we would see is one of my... And we would see Jesus hold this title in the Bible, what people gave him. is one of my favorite titles about Jesus. You guys want to know what it is? Yeah. It's my favorite one. Friend of sinners. That Jesus was so humble that anyone could come to him. That the people that he was most closely, closely associated with were people far off, were, were, were sinners. Just like me... And you were people that were far from God and needed help. And the people who gave him this title were actually actually his enemies. They were like, I thought this guy's supposed to be a religious guy. Why is he associating with sinners? But this is who he came for. This is who he came for because he came to be a savior. He came to be a savior. Jesus is a humble servant savior. If someone is a savior, or someone is a savior, something needs to be saved. And in the Bible describes that, that someone needs to be saved as all of us. That if, if we were all honest about our lives, if we really took a, a look into our heart, into our mind, into our actions, our whole life, we would know that we are so far from perfect. That we actually have fallen so short of God's standard. What the Bible said calls that it's sin. That sin it is our mistakes. It's all of our failures, mind, heart, our actions, and what sin does is actually creates a separation between us and God. And that separation keeps us from a relationship with God here on earth, but keeps us from a relationship with God forever. It keeps us from eternal life. And we couldn't do anything to change that circumstance on our own. We needed someone outside of our life to come, to live a life that I never could, and to die for my sin, to pay the price of my sin. And that is what Jesus did. And who did he come to die for? It shows us his love in Romans 5 He says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for the far off. He's so humble that anyone could come to him. And so that's, Jesus is a humble servant savior. But the last thing, really quick, is that Jesus is inviting all to experience him.